Okay, good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to this work session meeting of the Loveland Board of Education. I'd like to ask our treasurer for a roll call. Uh, Mr. Jarvis? Present. Dr. Lorenz? Here. Ms. Pettit? Here. Mr. Portune? Here. Mrs. Washburn? Here. All right. The first item on our agenda is to adopt the board agenda. I'd like to move to adopt the agenda as shown on board docs. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Portoon seconded. Is there any discussion about the agenda? Seeing none, nope. Mr. Wally, can we vote on that? Mm -hmm. Dr. Lorenz? Yes. Ms. Pettit? Yes. Mr. Portoon? Yes. Mrs. Washburn? Yes. Mr. Jarvis? Yes. Motion carried. I would like to invite you all, wherever you are joining, from wherever you are joining the meeting, I'd like to invite you all to rise and join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag, flag of, of the United, United States of America. America. And to the republic, to the republic public, which is which it stands, stands. One nation, One nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you. I apologize for the little bit of, of lag, uh, and I appreciate everyone's patience this evening with this meeting. It's a totally new format for us, um, and we're looking forward to uh, seeing how well this meeting runs this evening. Um, the first item on the agenda is a progress report, uh, starting with Superintendent Dr. Amy Kraus, and I believe there will be other folks helping her with this report. Yeah, we thought we would just uh, sort of go over the big ideas for um, how we've been going since the building closure, since the governor closed all of our school buildings. Um, I thought I'd lump them into sort of a safety and wellness conversation and uh, then a teaching and learning, remote learning conversation, and then ends up with facilities and maintenance. So feel free to ask questions. Um, um, we've been doing a lot. It's hard to capture all of that in just a, a brief overview, but um, I'll try and capture some of the highlights. Uh, for safety and wellness, our uh, food service has been uh, making meals since the as soon as closure started and continued to feed lunch and breakfast to students over spring break. We're really lucky. We've been partnering with Nest. Um, they, ha they support specific families in our district and help students with homework, but they've been partnering with us to help make meals and deliver meals to our families. Uh, and they're making upwards of 700 meals a day. And, uh, and getting those delivered out to our families. Uh, they're working really hard. So we're happy that we've, we've been able to continue to provide uh, food to our families. Um, you know, one of the things that we're talking about is how do we communicate that we have this opportunity for families that may find themselves in need as this progresses as this progresses you know we understand that people have different situations perhaps have taken a cut in pay or even lost their job and are unable to work and um, if they find themselves in a situation where a uh, free uh, a free lunch or, brec or breakfast or lunch for their student would be helpful. They need to contact us at, us at school. We're going to try to work hard to communicate that out so as people find themselves in that situation, we can make sure we expand that service to um, all of our students that could benefit from that. Um, as far as um, safety, again, and to back to backtrack onto the food, we have been in uh, planning meetings with Nest to make sure that we can continue to provide support um, throughout the rest of the school year. And Nest does a, a great deal of things for our students over the summer. So how we can maximize that and make sure that Nest can continue to support kids over the summer. So that's part of our planning procedure. From a, from a safety perspective, you've heard, I'm sure, on the news and from the governor that there's been um, a call to make sure that personal protective equipment gets into the hands of our first responders and to hospitals. Um, and to that end, Judy Leamy, our district nurse, has been organizing um, the things that we can provide to other entities um, and share that out, you know, the things from the health aides office, uh, the things that um, we have in our schools, 
uh, you know, a lot of gloves. Um, we loaned our thermometers out. Um, earlier in this season, we had talked about our, um, our Clorox 360 uh, sanitizer that um, reduces the flu vaccine. We've loaned that to the police department so that they can um, keep their, uh, their their vehicles sanitized uh, uh, quickly so we've tried to provide anything that we have we've tried to put that in the hands of our first responders in our local hospitals um, through either loan or donation um, and that's as our safety plan um, outlines that for us and we've been able to implement that by working with the city uh, john i see john's on was there anything else you wanted to add to the food and the and the wellness part of that and our gathering of our uh, our personal equipment that we've been loaning out and donating well i just got my audio set so i have no idea what you said so i'll agree with what you said <laughs> so you can you can go ahead on the bullet points because i'm going to call you back in at the end of this conversation so give you give me a few says my internet is unstable, so uh, can you still hear me? Can now. Can now. now. Can. Um, so uh, the next section that I wanna talk about is in uh, teaching and learning and look at, looking at remote learning. Um, one of the things that we uh, worked through at the beginning of our building closure, and one of the things that's one of the items that's recognized in one of the resolutions that I'll, that I'll recommend to you in a, in a few minutes is to make sure that we're completing the minimum hours. Um, a couple years ago, the state shifted from days to hours. Um, if you take our typical, um, our, our typical school day, we manage or we, we get to about 154 days uh, is what we would need to complete in order to get the minimum hours that the state requires. So we, um, we completed 131 days prior to the closure. So we feel very confident that our learning plan um, accommodates the other remainder, the remainder of the days that would be necessary just from a minimum. We, of course, our calendar goes far beyond the minimum but um, we feel confident that we'll be providing that level of support and instruction for students well beyond that. Um, Andrea, do you wanna go ahead and start talking about the teaching and learning plan that you put together with the principals and the teachers? Yeah, so um, as you know, the key to this entire uh, process has been flexibility and uh, pivoting and making changes as we go because when we first went out with the, the first announcement, we kind of approached it as a, a week of review, um, reinforce and enrich learning. So we weren't going to approach it as a new content introduction piece. Um, so when we originally launched um, our learning plans, we kind of looked at it from the lens of, from an elementary perspective, what are the things we're asking um, our early learners to must do and may do? So sort of a, here's a list of the things that we're asking you to do and here are the things that might be the extra pieces to that. We also committed to run our communications to parents and families and students K through uh, four through Seesaw, the digital platform Seesaw, and as well as six through 12 through Blackboard. So um, thankfully, a lot of that earlier work that we had done and trying to norm some of those processes, I believe, probably helped kind of get this, this particular uh, piece launched. So we left and we said, okay, we're going to do this reinforce and uh, review and enrich, and then we got the second announcement that said, let's plan beyond. Let's go out to May 1st. So um, the principals have been working very closely with their teacher teams through the support of teaching and learning to develop our instructional, instructional plans to start looking at how we are going to start implementing the new content pieces, um, which, as you know, is completely, um, completely a new challenge. Um, so part of what we're doing is uh, turning a lot of that over to our principals who are doing weekly checks um, on lesson plans as well as um, as many of you probably follow note they do like morning announcements they're following many of the same 
procedures that they would typically follow with their students. So um, those are some key things that we're doing with instructional plans. Also, uh, maintaining the idea that, the, that this is a flexible, um, a flexible option. So we launched, and I, I'm sure Dr. Krause will talk about this a little bit, our um, district survey on Friday. And it gave us kind of a building level overview and now we are launching into plans of having some of those teacher to student, teacher to parent surveys start rolling out so that we can be very um, receptive to where our parents are with their needs. We recognize that every household has a different um, situation at home and we want to be sure that we are um, that there's a healthy balance between um, introducing that new content in a way that is not overwhelming to both our students and our, our families without the proper support um, in place. So again, the key messaging with our instructional planning is more of let's be flexible. We have our launch um, week or two, take a look at it and kind of adjust and make those changes as, as needed. Um, Oops, we Andrew, all, before yep. you go on, Andrew, yep. I want to, jump into that survey. Um, I'll, in, I'll send a parent email out tomorrow to all the parents and sort of talk a little bit about the survey data and what we've done to um, address some of the concerns that were shared in the feedback. The, um, Friday, the very first week, we sent out a survey and just asked parents to, we sort of called it Goldilocks. Was it too much, just right, not enough? Uh, just very general questions. And then ask for some specific words that we'll share out. Um, with principals and teachers, but um, oh, just overall, uh, 67. We had 505 parents respond. Uh, respond. 67.1% uh, of the parents said that the amount of uh, work that was given was just right, and about 24% said it wasn't quite enough. So you can see different parents trying to balance out what works in their home, what doesn't work in their home for whether it's too much or not enough as people adjust. So our teachers will certainly help them do that. Um, this was uh, one that I thought was really important and I think will be helpful for teachers. We asked if the if the learning activities were able to be completed independently or not. You know, there's all things over social media about um, we're homeschooling. You know, it certainly isn't our intention at all that we are um, sending things home where we want the parent to have to teach the children um, what they need to do. We do understand that parents have to help kids log in. They might have to help them keep attention. Clearly they have to feed them lunch and worry about the dog and all the other things that we're trying to manage as we work from home. But you know, we, did, we, we, wanted to, we, don't, we don't want parents to feel like they have to teach their children. Uh, we wanna be able to provide that instruction from our end. So 54% of the parents that responded said that their kids were able to do it independently. And 40% said that students needed, their students needed assistance. But then when we followed up with whether that was in the appropriate amount of assistance, 78% um, said that the amount of assistance they provided was appropriate for their age group. And that 17% said it was a little more than usual, but it was still manageable. So just a very, very small percentage, just 4% of our families felt like they were overwhelmed with what they had to do to help their students. So that's a, you know, that's a, good, that's a good gauge for um, what we're trying to provide. And again, this week wasn't about new instruction, but just trying to build some routines. Um, you know, I, I was very proud of our teachers when asked about communication from your child's teacher, 87, 86% of people felt like they were able, that they got the right amount of communication from their teacher. And um, 67 plus, so 90, just over 91% of our parents that responded said, agreed or strongly agreed, That was going to be a good punchline. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you go back on Andrea. Sorry. <laughs> you're 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 back. Yeah. We mi we missed the X percent, and it sounded like it was going to be very positive. <laughs> uh, oh, the ninety-one percent of our parents that responded felt like their teacher strongly agreed or agreed that their teachers were accessible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm glad that you 
add me repeat that one. It just, uh, you know, that's been teacher's number one goal is just to be available so that they can uh, support families in getting through this. So I was pleased right. with that, those pieces of data. So I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Yes. Yeah. So as you can see, um, this is a, a work in progress. Um, this, this data that Dr. Krause just referenced is something that we're going to kind of take. We've already rolled that out to the principals who are going through that and looking into making their next iteration of their plans of how they're going to move forward with their survey data. Um, I, I think it, I mean, I echo what she mentions about the, um, the, the teachers, because I think you're going to uh, see in a few minutes when Mr. Duell joins in, that you'll see that that has paid off. So in a few moments, you'll see uh, with the equity piece. Um, so we, you know, launched some instructional plans initially, then we moved into let's make a pivot, let's make a change with the, the most recent uh, stay at home announcement by Governor DeWine. So then that took us to um, the concept of grading and what grading is going to look like in this new kind of remote learning venture that we're entering. Um, you know, initially when we launched our grading uh, pieces were basically like uh, be cognizant of the workloads that we're giving students. Um, remote learning is new for everyone and also this concept of not really holding students accountable for attendance. So in other words, if a student can't join um, a Google Meet at a certain point when the teacher has, um, has requested that time, perhaps the teacher could then record that, post that to a shared folder, and the student could access that when um, the time is, is appropriate. We're, again, trying to be very cognizant of the support level and the different needs of our families. We realize some of our parents are still working, and so, you know, kids could be with grandparents, they could be with other, you know, other family caretakers, and we just want to be sure that we are um, being cognizant of that and being very flexible. So once that shift to the May 1st closure came out, um, we had to again pivot and make adjustments in how we're kind of looking at grading. Um, so we got a little bit more um, definitive in terms of our, our types of assessments. Um, so we've kind of made, we've made statements with our teachers and uh, principals about the traditional summative assessment concept. You know, think back to when you did a unit, you took a unit test and you took the test and that test was your grade and you moved on to the next unit. That concept is not a very um, uh, palatable concept for remote learning and we have to be very careful about how to um, make those adjustments. So we've talked more about moving to more formative, short short cycle type assessments. And if there is a need for a summative assessment to adjust those so that those assessments are a little bit more inquiry based, a little bit more writing, which never hurts anything, right? Uh, Ms. Washburn is a former ELA Absolutely. person. Absolutely. So <laughs> I'm very excited that we're, that's an opportunity for them to pick up on that opportunity to, to do so a little bit more writing. Um, we are also looking at things like maybe we do some more digital portfolio pieces. Maybe we uh, find other creative ways to demonstrate our learning. So um, one of the res on the resolution tonight, you are going to note that there is, a, um, there is a clause there that's going to ask for a resolution to approve um, the grading piece adjustment for this particular fourth quarter. So we are looking at moving towards a, so our K through four is a standards-based grades, right? So they do not receive actual grades for uh, the report cards. And we do not start re put it recording grades till fifth grade. So fifth grade through eighth grade um, is going to be moving to a pass-fail option um, in their grading. And then our high school or any of our middle school students who are taking high four high school credit courses are going to remain on, um, on as a graded, graded courses. So the high school piece has been interesting as we've been trying to wrestle with what that would look like. Um, to be quite honest, our neighbors and friends are kind of all over the place. So we have about half of our neighbors who are choosing to stick with grades and we have the other half of our neighbors who are moving towards more of a pass-fail option for their high school students. When we get to high school, it is a little bit different because those are transcripted um, courses. Those transcripts follows the, follow those students to college. Um, it appears as if um, maybe policy and procedures of other organizations that are going to impact our students once they leave Loveland 
um, have not really caught up with where we are in um, our current situation. So it was, it was kind of a collaborative decision that perhaps we would remain with the grading option for our high school and then go pass fail 5-8. Um, you know, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a variety of different, uh, different thoughts and, you know, both sides to that and our neighbors and friends near us are wrestling with this exact same um, dilemma. I will tell you that um, our high school has worked very uh, collaboratively to come up with a way to make sure that students are not penalized. We again recognize that even many of our high school kids may not have the same opportunity for access that uh, others do. And so we are working on some options to, so that students would not be penalized for um, you know, maybe facing some of those challenges within, within their current situation. So um, that's where we are in terms of grading. It's, um, again, it's, it's, it's an interesting one, especially as students get into high school because it becomes a little bit a little bit more difficult um, in terms of that transcript following them. And so uh, we just wrestled with it and decided to err on the side of maintaining grades with adding some building level of flexibility in how those grades are um, going to be managed throughout the fourth quarter. So um, that's a lot in a, a very short time. Um, we are gonna be moving on to access and equity. Um, I, I, Am I thinking maybe if you have questions, we could wait until um, David and Eric have a chance to speak, if that's appropriate, and then, um, you know, we'll maybe, to make it more efficient, can follow that way. Okay. I wanted to take some time to talk about two separate but related topics. Um, one, what we are doing as a school district to meet the needs of our diverse learners, um, primarily our groups of students that have disabilities, um, as well as our English language learners, um, um, in addition to how we are meeting the needs of our students who are living in low socioeconomic status. Um, and then also what we are doing to continue with our efforts for social emotional learning uh, throughout the district, um, coupled with how we are continuing to provide mental health services for those students who have mental health needs um, because those needs don't go away um, just because we're on remote learning um, versus um, being educated in a brick and mortar building. Um, that being said, let's start with student services, um, special education, uh, English language learners. Obviously, the challenges that we have been faced with in moving to remote learning are compounded by um, the additional needs that these groups of students um, provide. So that has given us an opportunity to, to collaborate in ways that we've not collaborated before um, to find how we can best um, meet these needs um, in a more direct way. What we have done is started with what the context looks like for education at this moment in time. So having a remote learning platform, um, how do we make that accessible for students that have diverse needs? Um, what are the accommodations? What are the modifications we are making by working with those gen ed teachers so that students who have needs can continue to access that content? Um, in addition, we are required to continue to provide services. Um, however, those services in many ways can't reasonably be provided remotely. Um, so we've get designed some guiding principles for our teams and that with regards to what's feasible, um, what's reasonable, and what's appropriate at this time in this context. And that might not be the same as what those students would typically receive on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what we have found is, is great collaboration amongst the team, um, great collaboration with our parents, to determine what that might look like. Um, whether that be some of the reading and math intervention continue, whether that be our intervention specialists or related service personnel or educational aides use Google Hangout to work one-on-one -on -one to support a student or in a small group. Um, those things are happening and students are continuing to access the learning. They're continuing to receive 
some of those individualized supports that they need and are continuing to grow. Um, and it's been exciting to see that collaboration as it's unfolded. Um, we also have worked hard to provide that social emotional learning for all students, as well as for smaller groups of students that have unique needs. Um, our principals, our school counselors um, have taken the lead in terms of continuing to offer um, things through their daily messages to students, daily announcements, um, embedding within that concept that we've been teaching students through social thinking or social skills curriculum, or even at the middle school with the above the line work that the middle school has been working on with their population. Um, counselors are also folding in through those principal messages, weekly things along the lines of mindfulness are focusing on um, how to overcome um, difficulties, how to build resilience, giving those positive tools to students that they could use to help them in this time um, of crisis. We also are continuing with those one-on-one -on -one and small group mental health services that students have been receiving, either through school counselors, school psychologists, or our partner mental health agency, um, Best Point Behavioral Health, which um, is rebranded from the children's home. So therapy, case management, medication management, all of those pieces are continuing just in a remote fashion. Um, and it's been a feat to get that done in such a short, short time span without losing any of those students along the way. Um, one challenge that we're still working through a little bit is making sure that all of our students in the district continue to access remote learning. Um, this is more of a difficult challenge for students who are of low socioeconomic status. Um, however, our buildings have done an incredible job through calls, emails, texts, uh, social media, or seesaw um, administrators and staff and our school resource officers going to homes, um, working with NEST to connect to families, um, working with our therapists or children's home um, support to reach out to families. We've been able to reach just about every child um, preschool through eighth grade to connect them to the remote learning that they're receiving. Um, right now, LECC has reached every student. Um, LPS, LES have three to four students apiece. Um, the intermediate and middle school, maybe six to 10 students. Um, that's an incredible feat for thousands of children to make sure that they're all engaged with the learning that we've rolled out. And that's due to the work of this, this good collaborative group of professionals that are reaching out. Um, high school, we're, we're making great headway. We have right now about 100 students that we're concerned about, um, but Peggy, Brittany, Matt, and the team are making those efforts to go to home and make those connections. Um, obviously, with high school students, you have different challenges and some students being more independent are making different choices and not being as accountable. But even so, 100 is not a bad number. Um, we hope to make that even better as we move forward. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to David. All right, there I am. Good evening. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, as Eric was talking about access and equity with our students, I want to talk a little bit about how that relates to our technology and resources uh, that we have access to across the district. Um, you know, when you think about this, this time of remote learning, obviously we are all in new and uncharted territory. Um, and we're, you know, as Andrea spoke to, we are absolutely trying to be flexible and, and respond to the needs of our students. Um, one thing we've not really had to respond to, though, is uh, the, the access to tools and resources that we have um, to, to provide to our students um, at their remote learning settings at their home. You know, due to the investment that we've made since the 2014 operating levy, um, it has all been about... Um, establishing our infrastructure and our access to resources with, with Chromebooks, with student technology, and with building out our instructional programs um, to exist in that, in that digital um, realm of things. So from a, from a stance of being ready with systems, processes, tools, uh, we were really able to hit the ground running um, in regards to providing all of those uh, supports for our students. When I think about um, kind of looking, keeping in contact with our neighbors across the area, um, looking at the great work that they're doing, um, I know that a lot of those districts have had to make invest or additional investments 
um, in terms of some of the student technology pieces. Um, we've, we've, we were in really good shape going into this. So I'm very proud to say that, you know, the, the resources we have are, are paying off even more so today as we look at what we've been able to provide for our students. So that's, that's awesome. Um, you know, even with access to resources though, our, our message from the beginning has not been to jump into the remote learning. It's not all about the lessons. It's not about the assignments. It's about uh, making sure that we're taking care of our kids, making sure that we're staying connected as Eric spoke to. Um, it's, it's all about connection over content. And um, you know, as, as we've kind of hit the ground this past week, um, kind of entering week two of remote learning, um, we're really starting to see those tools come into play. So it's been wonderful. Um, huge props and just hats off to our instructional and technology teams. Um, I think everybody thought they were busy before. <laughs> and now the, the idea of, of busyness, I think, has taken on um, new territory, but just an amazing team supporting parents, students, teachers across the district day in and day out. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, access to computers and access to internet. So th those are really the tools that we need to kind of operate in this remote learning environment. So when we think about our, our environment at the, across Loveland, the middle school and high school is a one-to-one -one environment. That means that they function on a, on a day-to-day -day basis with every student having access to a, to a device, whether that's a district Chromebook that they're um, in the least to own program with or uh, their own device that they're bringing to school. So uh, seven through 12, we were already set to go with all kids leaving school that last day with the device to take home. Um, in grades K through six, things look a little bit differently. Um, very excited to say that we've provided um, three, up to 300 Chromebooks at this point um, for those students who are in financial need of needing a device at home. Um, as, as we all kind of, you know, as, as news came about with, with Governor DeWine um, putting plans in place, I was just so impressed with our, our principals and our techs and our APs and our counselors to reach out to families and our teachers to figure out what those needs were and to make sure that kids had what they needed leaving their doors. Um, so we're, we're very fortunate to be able to provide access to our students regardless of um, kind of what their um, access looks like at home. Um, so we're very fortunate in that regard. Uh, we continue to identify students as those needs come up. Um, that is ongoing work. Um, and that also relates to our access to internet. So, um, you know, having a device at, at home is one thing, but we've also got to be able to, to access the internet to get to the content. So, um, a couple years back, we started um, investing a small investment in about 30, um, as about 30 uh, hotspots that we began sending home with students as needs of uh, internet access began coming up at home. Um, as we've rolled remote learning out, some additional needs have come up. Um, that's where a small investment has been made in those hotspots. Um, we currently have 75 hotspots out with students providing access to internet that they need that provides internet access to their sold student device. Um, and we have uh, some additional hotspots coming as our, our principals and assistant principals and counselors continue that work with our families, uh, making sure that they have what they need. So huge props to everybody involved. Um, it truly takes a village to pull these things off and that involves also our community resources and partners and all of our parents and families. Um, so, you know, we were in very good shape going into this and we're really proud of the work that's, that's been going on there. So that kind of wrapped things up from my end. Um, I think now would probably be a good time for questions for the three of us, for Andrea, Eric, and myself. Okay, I see Mrs. Washburn raising her hand. I have a comment, not a question. Um, as a parent, from my perspective, I just want to commend everybody on staff. Um, everything that I've seen that was sent home for my children has been amazing, and the emphasis has cer certainly been on the connection over content. So to all of the teachers, kudos. And then also as someone who has been tasked with ensuring that all of my English language learners in a different district receive equitable access to um, education in these challenging times. I know how difficult it is. It's extremely difficult. And I just want to commend Andrea, Eric, and David on doing, and your team on doing an amazing job there as well to make sure that everybody has access and that it's equitable. And I will say it's our, it's our principals leading that work at the buildings with our teachers that really make that happen. Um, they have just been instrumental in that flexibility piece and working. So that's awesome. Yeah, they're Thank clearly you. doing a phenomenal job. Yeah. Other questions? Mr. Portune. 
A question for Mr. Duell. Um, Eric, I, I'm sure things like services like PT and OT are, are uh, well, challenging isn't a word at all, but <laughs> are we are we doing anything? Is there any kind of still distance, you know, for doing any of that kind of work that's going on for the students who um, who have that as part of their plan? Yes, um, in terms of related services like speech language pathology, OT, PT, some of the vision and hearing support, it depends on the students and somewhat depends on the age level of the students, but we are offering support um, one, through consultative support to the teachers as well as to the parents regarding how they themselves can help support students in that curriculum that students are working with. Um, they're providing activities to go home um, that they can coach students and parents through. Um, if it requires that hand over hand type support, um, in some instances we're providing quote unquote teletherapy. Uh, the state legislature has relieve some of the restrictions that we've had with regards to the ways in which uh, services are provided um, so that there aren't as many professional board concerns. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are aware, those providers are not only licensed by the state of Ohio for uh, the Department of Education, but they have separate licensing boards as well. So this Ohio Speech Language Hearing Association is an example. Um, or, or speech language um, licensure board. So those restrictions are now allowing them to do more remote service type um, delivery. Um, they can even continue to bill uh, for Medicaid reimbursement through the Ohio School Medicaid program um, for some of that teletherapy that they're providing. So it really depends on the age, the ability of the student to access um, therapy through the computer, or if not, how those providers are consulting with families um, to be able to do the hand over hand type support that students need at home. It varies. Yeah, thanks. Re really good work in a very challenging area on your part. Thank you. I appreciate that. Other questions? <laughs> Mr. Jarvis. Hey Eric, just real quick, just help me out a little bit. You know, you talk, and and let me first state that again, fantastic, you guys. I mean, first of all, to have 500 people respond to a survey, that's that's impressive in itself. Um, but with those kind of results in a short period of time, so you know, kudos to kudos to all you guys. Um, as usual, I'm not shocked. So, but uh, you know, help help me out with you know, you mentioned there's a handful of students here, a handful of students there. A uh, hundred at the high school. I mean, just 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 on my own sick curiosity. I mean, what what's that look like? Trying to hunt these kids down, um, trying to figure out what's going on. And the hunt and the hundred kids at the high school. I mean, are those seniors, or, or are they spread out all over the place, or what's the complexion of those seniors? I'd have to ask the Peggy. The high school. I'd have to ask Peggy, but I believe they're spread fairly evenly across. The grade levels at the high school. Um, my conversations with Peggy and the team have been that half of those students are probably the ones that have been on our list that we've been supporting through social services because of truancy and other issues um, typically, so that's not something new for those students. Um, others might just be those that are experiencing some challenges right now on um, accessing remote learning and having other responsibilities that you know, they might need to be providing child care at home for their siblings while their parents are continuing to work, or they themselves might be needing to work um, to help support their families. Peggy's just texting me that, yes, um, there are a few seniors, but that's very, very few um, that it's spread out amongst the population at the high school. The effort that the principals, the teachers, the therapists, counselors, um, and others have put in they are literally going door to door to track kids down. Um, they're working with school resource officers, um, community providers, um, and multiple modalities of communication, whether it be phone, email, text, or face-to-face, -face, they're trying to track these kids down. And um, as we can see from preschool through eighth grade, 
And that's a phenomenal feat that they've got nearly 100% of those students engaged at this point. Yeah, um, sure. And even at the high school, while we have a larger number, um, I think those students have other life obstacles that are preventing some of them from accessing just yet. But our hope is to continue to work at it. And in those ways that we can wrap some supports around them, we'll do that. Um, and I believe it's continue. the probably the situation that all or most school districts are in as well with the high yeah. school having that higher number. I know <clears throat> I'm certainly experiencing that. <laughs> yeah, and some, some we'll things we've been them. figuring out, like, um, you know, Eileen had talked about English language learners, and we've worked with our um, our consultants or our contracted supports for interpreter services to speak to those families by allowing teachers to have their personal cell phones connected to that system so that they can access a therapist or an interpreter almost immediately to be able to communicate with the family when those opportunities come up. They don't have to be at a district phone to do that anymore. Um, so trying to find the need to help create the collaborative atmosphere that we need um, and then just absolutely floored with the responsiveness, I think, from the state level down to ease some of those restrictions and to allow us to do what we need to do. Um, it's truly been a remarkable collaborative seat to change some of the culture that's needed to change. And hopefully, I think if, if we look at the, the light at the end of the tunnel or the positives that come from this, look at the level of collaboration we've been able to see. Uh, we were just talking about this today with the middle school leadership. Um, how people have come together to have shared ownership and shared responsibility and identified goals that they want to hold together. That is incredible. Um, not that we didn't have a lot of that before, but it, this has just heightened that awareness. And hopefully we can continue to capitalize on that cultural shift that we're going through at the moment um, and see that as a positive for the crisis that we've been in. Um, and there's many more positives that are, that'll come from that, but this is just one example. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that. Uh, you know, again, there are, there's a mirror, myriad, a myriad of things that I'll never think of that have to be, that have to be accomplished and have to be dealt with, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, yeah, there, ever since this whole thing started, I, you know, the, the thought of kids falling through the crack or something like that has always been mm -hmm. stuff that's in the back of my mind, so. Um, Those are the ones so, that keep you up at night. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, but I mean, you said it. it never crossed my mind that a kid might not be able to do what they need to do because they're actually taking care of their siblings, right? Mm -hmm. You know. So mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I appreciate those comments, and and I agree with you 100. percent The the collaboration and everything that's been going on throughout this is it's impressive, and again, not shocking, but it's really good to see. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks. I have one more question. Mr. Portoon. Uh, David, with with the, the full number of the like, hotspots that we have out there and with our students working remotely, do we have an idea of um, if we still have a gap in terms of, of access with students and how, how big that might be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, kind of the same points that Eric was bringing up as, as we think about those students that, um, you know, we continue to uh, try to connect with. Um, yes, there, there are a few students out there who we know we have not made a connection with and, and we feel um, that they probably do not have the access that they need. Um, so, you know, that's, that's working with our, our building teams, our assistant principals, our principals. We've, we've had folks going door to door. Our tech team is going door to door to deliver resources and hotspots and obviously following uh, proper social distancing procedures and protocols. Um, but we are making every point of contact possible. Um, and that also includes uh, working through, we're starting to identify processes in which we could work with Nest um, and thinking through, you know, as, as they have some of those connections and ties with some of our students also. Um, it's just layer by layer trying to get down there, but we're feeling pretty confident with our, um, the, the work that we've been able to accomplish, but we know that there's still some students who we need to make that handoff with. 
So with <clears throat> with that extra 300 Chromebooks that you, you were talking about deploying as well, how many Chromebooks do we actually have out in use at this point total? Um, so if you, are we considering all of the one-to-one -one machines as well? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so if, if we think about averaging about 250 Chromebooks per grade level, um, we'll do the math on that real quick, 500, um, 1,000, 1,500. We've got about probably 1,800 Chromebooks in the hands of students right now across the district um, that they're utilizing to access remote learning. Okay, that's, I mean, it's great that that was all in place. Okay, anything else? Dr. Krause, would you like to um, add to your report or do you have more to, to continue I, with? I have more. Yes, okay. <laughs> because every day things change. You know, we were talking about the high school and, um, you know, certainly all of the logistics and all of the services are, are important and our primary concern about making sure kids are safe. But the reality is, is this is a really tough time for seniors and, you know, students who thought that they were going to get their senior year. Um, you know, the special recognitions, the different, um, privileges that they might have as a senior, um, but, you know, really culminating in graduation. So, as you know, we typically have, or have had our graduation at CINTAS yesterday. CINTAS did officially cancel their dates in through May. So, our date, um, it, it has been, they've been canceled. They canceled all opportunities for events until August. Uh, so, I mean, this isn't a, a big surprise. Lots of the large venues have already had already canceled. So uh, Peggy had reached out to kids. What kinds of things, what ideas do they have, you know, tr for us to try to really work hard on um, how to make, gra make graduation happen and make it be an event. Um, so, you know, we'll, we're exploring options. Uh, we can talk about what might be available in August at CentOS. We certainly have a stadium and different things here. Uh, but, you know, the truth of the matter is, is we have to wait to see what kind of orders we'll be under in the state of Ohio for, you know, stay home orders and um, for distancing orders and how we might make that happen. But the high school staff is, uh, my high school team is really committed to listening to students, getting student input. And, um, you know, when we, you know, we promise to make that day special because uh, it's an important day for students. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly understand that. Um, the high school and middle school will send out, they'll send out a communication either tonight or tomorrow to parents about the changes in grading. In that, we'll also um, talk a little bit about high school seniors. Their last day will be May 15th. Um, we won't be giving exams, so their last day will come earlier. Um, and then we will, you know, have a plan for some sort of a graduation ceremony, certainly staying in line with the governor's orders. So graduation is a work in progress. Um, and uh, you know, we'll just have lots of plans and backup plans and backup plans to the backup plans to make sure that kids get recognition that they deserve um, after completing high school. Uh, any questions about that? Now, having a high school senior, I can tell you that everything you've just said is accurate. And that <laughs> I was, I, you know, I was unaware of all of the things until he ran through <clears throat> his list of senior activities uh, that we're not going to happen. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's a disappointment. It is. And so, you know, we, we just want to make sure that kids feel a oh, while well, it'll be different, um, you know, taking strides to really make sure kids feel recognized and um, it's a big accomplishment and they should be able to celebrate that. And they'll certainly remember their senior year for other reasons. Uh, we want them to remember it for some great reasons too. So. Uh, that's, you know, that's ongoing work um, with, the, with the seniors themselves and at the high school. Um, uh, we still also have buildings and buses and upkeep and uh, general things that are going on. John, you want to just give a few updates on some of the staff is working on and uh, some of the projects we have? Yes. Um, very interesting. We've got Fred Barnes, Steve Allman, and Bill Cole are every single day walking every square inch of the buildings, uh, making sure that there are no water leaks, making sure there are no doors ajar. Um, and I've seen Fred up on here on Saturday, so I know he's probably bored knowing Fred. So they are checking every building every day. Um, 
little shout out to Greg Osi. He is uh, our transportation guy. It's going downtown Cincinnati on Mondays and Thursdays uh, with our big white van to pick up food for the food pantry to relieve their staff from having to do that. So uh, he gets down there, loads it all up, brings it back and, and gets it out to the uh, pantry, which is just nice that we're able to do that. We have the facilities or the vehicles to be able to do it. Um, Clint Custodial has not yet started cleaning. Uh, Bill Cole and the head custodians are trying to wrap their arms around how they're going to do it. Uh, historically, they've done team cleaning where the entire district custodial staff gets together. They all just attack certain areas together. And it's a great thing for them to um, regroup with each other. And it gets a lot of nice camaraderie going. So now they're trying to figure out how they're going to do it this summer. Um, team cleaning six feet away from each other most likely won't work. So I would imagine they will just stick to their own buildings and stay away from each other. Um, but getting cleaning supplies right now is very difficult. So we're waiting until our supplier says, okay, we have enough for you to get started. So we're just kind of trying to figure the whole thing out right now. Um, Bus mechanics, as you know, we had one mechanic retire this year, so we're down to two mechanics, and they are working daily uh, to prepare the fleet for all of the inspections, the state inspections. Um, they want to make sure they get it all done, seeing as how they are down one person, and uh, they're enjoying being able to work together. They, um, they know how to do it. They know how to stay away from each other to do it, so um, they're just planning on having everything ready to go for most likely next fall. Um, as far as projects, we are just finishing up the engineering for the replacement of the middle school cooling tower. Um, we had talked a while back about redoing repairs on it. Uh, finally, we got to the realization that it, even if we repair it, it's still a 20 year old machine. So. Um, we, they, we are working on all of the um, documentation to put that out for bid. Uh, the primary wing has two rooftop air conditioners that I was kind of hoping would not have to be replaced, but we are going to have to replace them now um, to keep that building cool for the next however many years. Uh, so that project is being engineered now. Again, I hope it will be ready. Well, the documentation will be ready. Uh, and all these projects, when we can start doing things again, then the bid packages will be ready to go out immediately. So hopefully we can um, beat some of the rush. And oh, the final one is the um, just engineering work on the attic sprinkler system replacement. Uh, that is still ongoing right now. Um, we should have the documents ready within the next month or so. So everything will be ready to go once we can start releasing work again. Questions? Thank you. I don't see any. Oh. And the Thanks, last uh, thing we have is um, uh, Kevin's been busy at work uh, finishing up uh, the audit and I think he has some things to share. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, so, you know, despite the fact that schools are closed, there's a lot going on right now, um, despite what, what some people may think at this moment in time. Uh, I think we've all discussed a lot of things that are occurring and some things that have been added to our plates. Uh, one thing that I just wanted to give an update on was our audit. Um, so we had an audit this year. We have an audit every year. Uh, we are audited by the state of Ohio. And uh, we did get that back uh, just after the election and or the assumed election. Um, and we did receive a clean audit. Um, what a clean audit really means is there's no findings, material citations, weaknesses, or deficiencies, and no other financials or other concerns. Um, so uh, I can tell you that it's something that we, as a treasurer staff, are very proud of. Um, you know, I, I would love to say that I could take credit for it, but I definitely can't. I have a great team of people that work with me and they deserve all the credit in the world. So uh, what that also means is that uh, having a clean audit in this particular case means that we also receive something called the Auditor of State Award. 
Uh, we've received it uh, multiple times in the past, uh, many consecutive years. And so, uh, again, we are proud to be able to say that we have received it once again. Uh, so I don't know if you have any questions or anything specific on that. Any questions for Mr. Hawley? I'll ask a question. So, so Kevin, we were audited by the state of Ohio this year, and I believe we, um, prior to this year, had not, but um, it was by others. But the state audit, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the you know, mythology around state audits are there much more detailed and, and can be painful than others. So, um, so passing that with flying colors is a very good thing. Yeah, and that's a good point, too, because, um, you know, in the past, uh, this, so the state determines who audits the school district. We do not determine that because um, that would obviously be a conflict of interest. We would not want that responsibility. Uh, so the last five years, they used an independent firm. Um, a lot of it has to do with the amount of schools that they can take on. But it doesn't mean that they are not a part of the process. Uh, the state reviews everything that they receive from the auditors. So although an independent firm does the auditing, uh, the state does review every detail, um, every, every, every specific uh, piece of data that they receive. So, um, so the state still does review that, but you're, you're correct. We did have the state this year. And um, sometimes those can be a little bit more challenging, if you will. And so I think... We're incredibly proud to be uh, once again receiving the Audit Auditor of State Award. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, mm -hmm. Please extend our congratulations to your department uh, whenever you have an opportunity to congratulate them. Um, yes. and, uh, I've, we appreciate I've, e that. I've emailed congratulated them at this point. Thanks. We usually take a picture together, but it would have to be six feet apart from each other. So, I don't know. You need to get around a camera for that, I guess. That's yeah. right, yeah. Yes. Okay, Dr. Krause, is that um, all for your report at this point? That is. There's a lot going on. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, everybody all right on the board to move on to the next item on the agenda? Can I throw in something kind of random since we were talking about NEST and meeting the needs of all of our students? Yes. Just real quick, just reminding people since we're streaming and this might reach hopefully more people about the care center, which I know that we aren't directly affiliated with, but it's still, they offer great resor resources for students and family members. Um, on Wednesdays, they have a dry food drive where they provide diapers, paper products, things like that. And it's just on the corner from where I live. And I know right now they're doing it as a drive through to keep the social distancing they have doctors available there twice a month for anybody 18 and over. Um, they have mental health services. They have resume building and job search services as well as ESL classes. So um, there are some great resources in our community that are available right now. That's at North Star? Yeah, the care Northern. center at North Star. Okay. Thank you, Eileen. All right, the next item on the agenda is to uh, have some discussion about the Planning Commission membership. Just as a reminder, um, before we began all of this uh, social distancing and remote uh, learning and remote board meetings, uh, we were able to have um, 38 applications come in for uh, community members for our Planning Commission. Um, the plan is that the Planning Commission would have 18 community members and seven um, district members. Uh, so at this point, each board member has had the opportunity to review the 38 community applications. They were blind reviewed, the names were removed from the applications, uh, and each board member reviewed them and submitted a um, a ranking or a rating according to a rubric, and those have been compiled. And so we have those, um, that data to refer to. Uh, however, we have a little bit of a challenge in that uh, it's going to be somewhat difficult to get a planning commission started 
remotely. So at this point, it's uh, appropriate to have some discussion with the board about how to proceed with the data from the, the ratings that were done and how to pre proceed with beginning to think about seating a planning commission. So discussion is appropriate at this point. I don't see any hands raised yet. Well, I think um, from what, what I know there, as we move forward, I think that there are some places we can start. So we've all kind of gone through a review process um, and uh, Dr. Krauss has compiled kind of our individual reviews. So from my perspective, looking at it, there's some initial things that we can, you know, we could decide on. We could decide on uh, a bottom cut line um, if we were kind of all in agreement that uh, the bottom X number um, kind of fit within that scoring table is the bottom X number that then um, would not require further discussion amongst the group because of uh, we were pretty much all in agreement on that um, as well as we could potentially do that with a top number as well if we were, you know, if we felt comfortable with that, that we didn't have to really go in depth of discussion. And then we'd have to come up with the plan of, for that middle section, um, what is the plan forward with that? Is that a, we take a look at the averages and, and what uh, the scores were of other board members and relook at things ourselves. Let's say that that's a new, quote, a new pool of, 10 or 15 or you know, however we want to look at that um, and go through and either discuss or take another pass to reevaluate on those. Um, I'm just kind of talking out loud here. Of, of I, I would also mention that I looked at, um, in addition to not knowing the names of the applicants uh, on the uh, compiled data, we don't know which board member uh, rated which person with which number. So I did take a look at it and um, checked back with my ratings to see where I was very different than other board members and um, just to see if I found anything that I wanted to uh, make a case for or anything that I needed to review. And I did not find anything in mine. I don't know if other board members did that same thing. Um, mm -hmm. or if other board members have, as Mr. Portoon suggested, a cut score for the number to be dropped off and drop out of consideration. Anybody have a suggestion for that or other discussion? I'm not no seeing. One, no one's speaking. <clears throat> I'm just going back and looking to see where that cut line potentially would be. Um, I did the same thing, Dr. Lorenz, and went and looked at mine, and most numbers were pretty in line. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you also. I also went in just kind of see if uh, if mine was, was not in line with most, and I really didn't find any. I was like, okay, well, I really missed the boat on that one. Um, I think we might all agree that there are at least three to five at the bottom um, that were obviously at the bottom. Um, so, I mean, I, I think if we're, if we're looking at this like an interview process, let's, 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 let's take care of the easy stuff first. And, uh, and then I think, yeah, there were some at the top. You know, I don't know if we want to pick, you know, say 60% or 80% or something like that and take, take 80% from the top and then, then have, which would, you know, and then have a discussion about filling the other, whatever that number is, five to 10 positions or whatever. So I, and, you know, the one thing I will say and in, in, in having gone through all these uh, in general, I was very impressed with uh, the, the quality and, 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 you know, the, the applicants and, and, and what, what had to be said and things like that. So, um, with, with very few exceptions. 
So uh, I agree. I was also impressed with the the motivation that was expressed. These were folks who who definitely wanted to uh, serve in this capacity. I wonder if we could look at the numbers the the top score in in each the top score per board member would have been twelve. So if a person had a perfect score, their average would be a 12. Uh, I wonder if the board would agree to perhaps saying that a six or lower was a, uh, a number that would be at, uh, to not be considered at this point. If, uh, if an average was six or lower, that might be cut or is, that, uh, is, is there another number that the board is interested in? I just wrote the same exact thing down on my paper, six and under. Yeah, you're actually talking about the number six or 6.4, because there's the, you know, you can go I, above I was just it. looking at the number six, but, uh, you know, if yeah. you want to pose 6.4, that's, as, that's okay as well. That's averaging, I mean, that's uh, rounding down to a six, so we could right. do that. So that's, that's seven or eight that, yes. could, be, that could be cut. Yeah. Yes. I think that's a good start. And then, Art, how many did you s suggest keeping from the top? You said eighty. I, I, I was just throwing it out there. I don't know if we want to. We want to say let's take the top seventy-five percent and then talk about the the ones in the middle. Or I mean, I don't know. It's in my head right now, it's kind of a random number. I mean, you could do eighty percent, and if we did eighty percent, then we'd only have to have only five that we would have to figure out, right? Because it's twenty-five people on the committee. So if we did 80% from the top, then that, that's 20 people right there. My, we're we're going to take 18 from this group. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. Total, we're going to take 18. That's right. Sorry about that. So that, that would be one way to look at it is to, um, uh, for the board at the, the next meeting to discuss the top 18, determine if there's the diversity that we wanted and um, simply look at the middle group individually and make um, suggestions if we wanted to bring any of that middle group into that top group? I think that sounds good because I was thinking around like nine and up would be good as far as their average number and that would put us right around 18 but then like you said go through it to ensure we have the diversity um, and then reevaluate some of the ones in the middle there so 20 uh, the 8.6 gives you 20. 8.6 gives you 20. so and i know that's more but that that was a was a it was a cutoff so i i picked it and it gave you 20. We had, and Amy, I, you know, I don't know, but I'm just asking this question. Um, do we have any that we, any criteria, for example, were, were there any that were turned in by spouses that we generally would know we would not want both of those? And so that might make us look at a smaller total. There are two applicants within that top 20 uh, that are spouses. So I would think just choosing one of them. I think that sounds good for um, the purpose of getting more diversity in there. Right. So if, so my question, why, what I would, I mean, this is just one thing to kind of think, look at, think of, if we took that top 20 um, as the starting point and then we took, so we, we didn't necessarily look at them again, but looked at then between number 21, which I think is 8.4 as the average score, mm -hmm. down to, let's say we took the next, we looked at that group down through the ones like six, that uh, the number of six that we were going to cut. There are a few in there that are very different where some of us rated someone very low and someone rated someone very high. And so my question is, 
the first thing that do we want the first thing that we do maybe the person who rated those very high look at that and see if that's truly one that you want to discuss about moving up into that top 19 or or not. I'm just trying to think of some criteria you know or let's say one of those was mine and I had rated them very higher than others I'd look at it again and say okay they still wouldn't they still wouldn't be above the top 19 of where I put them so I wouldn't have an argument for putting them you know up within the 18 that we were keeping does that make sense yeah like if I rated somebody high and you rated them low I would go back and reevaluate that application to see if it's somebody that I'd want to advocate for to um, be put on the committee. Right. Correct? And and knowing already then where we have averaged out with this top, let's say, let's call it top 19 that were highlighted since one of them is a spouse in the top 20. I think that I think sounds like a, Sounds like a possibility. Um, I think the other possibility is that even if we don't have any of those cases to uh, make, that we look at the top uh, 20 and uh, begin to think a little bit about the diversity there, um, whether they're represented, representative geographically, representative parent versus not a parent of a student in the district, those kinds of things. And if we, I, I don't believe that this will be true, but if we were to find that the top 18 were all uh, women who were parents of Loveland students who lived in Hamilton County, that would not be the 18 that we would choose. Um, so that we could draw from the little bit lower scores if we needed to, um, change the diversity of the group a little bit. The top, those, the, the 20 mm -hmm. top scores, uh, uh, they, 15 are male, five are female, uh, 15 are parents, and five are not, not parents of a student in the district. I, I'm sure others are parents, but mm -hmm. Um, uh, but the counties are mixed pretty well. There's uh, eight from Claremont, one from Warren, and 11 from Hamilton. Okay. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know the diversity of the whole group. Perhaps it's a 75-25 split for male, female, and applicants. I, I can't tell you right off the top of my head what the split is. I just happened to look up that top group to, to you know, so you could start talking about representation. Okay. So that sounds like a plan for homework for the board to first look at that middle group um, and see if there's a case to be made um, and then to uh, sort of quickly review um, particularly the, the uh, two that are spouses of which one would need to be chosen if, the, if that's the board's desire as opposed to both of those. Um, and. Um, so we can certainly work on that. Um, we would not be doing any of this discussion, I don't think, until our next meeting. Um, but the question that we, we might wanna consider at this point too, before we get too far down that path is the feeling of the board as to constituting this commission, um, whether it's possible that it could be done remotely or whether it needs to wait until there can be an in-person meeting of this group. Um, so any thoughts on that? I think in person, personally in person, I think would be the better option. Um, if we're looking a, another month or so out, I think we're okay. If for some reason this, uh, situation gets pushed out even further then we might have to look at remote but you know then at the same time then we might have to look at educating how to do a remote and all that so i mean i'm personally i would prefer face to face if i was on the committee to start with anyway um but uh i think time is going to decide that for us to be honest with you 
Yeah, my preference would certainly be face to face if that's viable, but you know, it's kind of the same as art. It depends on how long that that pushes out. Um, I would agree that face to face is always better, but um, I think with all the current technology that getting it going sooner rather than later could be beneficial just because right now people have the flexibility in their schedules to meet and meet probably a little more often than when they're back to work and the hustle and bustle of sports and such. So, so that actually, the fact that you said timing brings up another question of mine of, so even if we have this block of, let's say 20, <clears throat> What we don't kind of have laid out yet here are um, if they have said anything about availability, like they were only available once a week or, or whatever to look at, if that was problematic, um, or kind of a quick run through of what committees were they interested in. While I think most people would probably, I would hope most people would be happy serving on any of the subcommittees. Um, people did put down which ones they were interested in. And so if all 20 are just one single committee, is that an issue for us? Um, and is there, uh, is there a process there that we have to consider? Whether that's notifying them and saying, everybody pick this so we're, you're not guaranteed to be on the committee that you had as a preference. Um, Just talking. I understand. Uh, this is a new we, process for all of us. Yes. What if we say that we will do that work of looking at the top 20, and I believe that everyone everyone has the applications without the names, correct? correct? You still have the applications. That's correct. You would have your yes. rankings and the data on the spreadsheet. You could look at those and... Um, I seem to recall just off the top of my head that we had a lot more people saying that they were interested in the finance committee mm -hmm. than other committees, but I could be misremembering. I, I did see a lot of interest in finance. So we could begin to delve into that top 20 or so and looking at, at seeing their availability and their committee preferences and perhaps be ready at our next meeting to have a discussion of whether we have actually come up with the same 18 uh, top people uh, or whether we want to add some from the middle group. And then what we could do is contact those folks and find out if they are still interested. Um, this, this interesting time that we are in may have changed some people's availability, some people's um, desire to be a part of something like this. They may have other um, other responsibilities that they need to take on and feel they can't do this planning commission at all right now. So begin to contact folks and contact them about the, the committee that they would be interested in after the next meeting that we have. I know that on two of the applications that rate it really high. One was available on Wednesdays only and another person was not available for Wednesdays <laughs> every other day. So that is a consideration because I mean, I, I remember I made notes of that. That's the only reason why I remember because they were both great candidates. Yeah. I mean. Thoughts? Uh, I think Art was saying something, but he looks like he has frozen. I think Art has frozen. Art, <laughs> can you hear us? But while we're waiting for Art's uh, internet to look at it. Up. This is going to be a process. <laughs> <laughs> you froze for a I, while, Art. Say that again. Yes, yeah, say that again. Uh, let's see. What did I say? I said it's going to be a <laughs> process. So let's focus on the top 18 for our homework. Um, Try and find what we believe are the best candidates to start with, uh, with a good mix, and then we will start to sort through the, the nuances of are they still available and, and all that good stuff. I mean, again, I think I said this isn't going to happen overnight, you know, and, and, and you make a very good point. 
things have changed drastically in four weeks. So, you know, people have different things going on in their lives. And uh, the, um, the other thing that we need to remember, if this board does come to an agreement upon 18 people, we did also make the statement that since this is the very beginning of this planning commission, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have to fill all 18 seats at the beginning. We could start with a smaller number and add to that number, say in the fall. So get started with a smaller number and uh, give consideration to adding to that um, as we go along. Yeah. Right. And, and we also talked about, uh, or at least I believe uh, Dr. Lorenz brought up at the time, do we want to come up with a, a process where we identify a staggered duration? Yeah. So certain people may serve for a year and some others for this first round are designated as a year, two years, whatever. So then we have a uh, staggered replacement as opposed to all at a given time right. and how yep. that would, how that would work. Yep. Add that to the list. Okay. Well, yeah. I think that becomes a little easier if we don't fill all of the slots in the beginning, because then the next round would have a different, they could be on a different cycle and it doesn't have to be, you know, they started two months after the first group. It doesn't have to be that, Oh, your your term's up two months after theirs. It could just be that you're on the one year cycle or you're on the two year cycle. I mean, something to to think about. Amy, can we? Well, and everyone can tell me whether they want to do this or, or not. But can we know which of the two applicants by number are spouses? I so, believe on the spreadsheet they're marked blue. Yeah, they're. Blue oh, that's what the blue is. Okay. Got I it. realized after I, I uploaded it, I didn't put a key. So my <laughs> blue equals married. Got it. Well, who knew? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, then we will uh, plan for time in our next meeting to discuss the top 18 or 20 and also a case for any of the other uh, applicants who did not fall in that top 20 if a board member wants to make a case for one of those. I'll uh, say, I, I think I captured all of that in notes for planning moving forward, but additionally, assuming the board um, elects to change the, to move back the board meetings on the resolution that'll come up later in the meeting, the, the next meeting that you would discuss this would be April 30th. And by then, we would certainly know where we stood on the current May 1st uh, stay home order. So, you know, when it, part of their conversation is, you know, in person or not in person, by that point, we would at least have some idea of where we stood um, in Ohio from, a, um, you know, for our opportunities for distancing or gathering at all or, or wherever we were on that. So I think the timing would work out on that as well. Okay. 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 Thank right, you for the question. work on this, Amy. Yep. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, then, seeing no more discussion, I believe we will move into the superintendent resolutions that we have. I will make a note that the 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 .3 are all resolutions that have been necessitated by the current situation um, as far as the virus is concerned, uh, what kinds of meetings we can have, what kinds of things can happen in the school day, what kinds of things can happen in the school life as far as evaluation is concerned. So that's this list of um, three upcoming resolutions. And the first resolution is a resolution declaring an emergency, suspending board policy related to public participation at board meetings, and authorizing remote meetings. Um, do I have a motion for that? I see Mrs. Okay. Washburn moving that. Is there a second? Mr. Oh, Portune. So we have a motion and a second. We have this um, resolution. It is written in its entirety on uh, board docs. That's where you can reference the entire resolution, and it is necessitated by the fact that um, social distancing is required, and so we cannot have 
more than 10 people at a meeting. Uh, and in fact, right now, I don't believe we can have a meeting even with 10 people. Um, so the state has passed a law allowing virtual meetings, which is what we are having right now. Uh, any discussion or any questions about this resolution? And that um, does expire at some point, I believe, right? In December? Yes, it was December 2020. It has a sunset of uh, December 2020 based on the law. Okay. But that would not indicate that it is our plan to oh, have no. that kind of... Oh, no, no. ...or suspend uh, anything till that point. That is the, the farthest point that it could happen, according to law. Right certainly go back to having in-person meetings and following our normal procedure as soon as uh, the health department would allow. So just, and just to clarify, our meetings are still public because they're live streamed. That's part of the requirement. Okay. Um, and uh, the public participation that this refers to is the hearing of the public in business meetings. Um, it, is, it is not that we are not still making these public. Yes, good point, thank you. Any questions or discussion? No. Seeing none, Mr. Hawley, can we vote on that? Ms. Mm -hmm. Pettit? Yes. Mr. Portune? Yes. Mrs. Washburn? Yes. Mr. Jarvis? Yes. Dr. Lorenz? Yes. The next resolution is a resolution for a contingency plan for the 2019-2020 school year in the event school is closed for more than the hours permitted under board policy and state law. So this is what allows the remote learning. It also allows for the extension of the use of something like blizzard bags if there is a case where someone cannot connect remotely. And again, this is all according to law. So can we have a motion for the contingency plan resolution? I see Ms. Pettit first, second. Now oh, nobody, second. Mr. Jarvis. Okay, so Ms. Pettit moved and Mr. Jarvis seconded. Uh, questions about this resolution? The details of this was primarily um, uh, when Andrea was talking about instructional plans, the, the real implementation. I mean, this is the law, it's a resolution that says we're gonna follow the law that was related to this so that we could support kids and and do business remotely. The, the meat on the bones or how we're implementing that law was primarily um, the discussion from teaching and learning tonight. And I do notice that it does allow for changes if necessary. In other words, we have a closure till May 1st. Uh, if um, that is extended or that is changed to a different date, uh, changes can be made in this plan according to this resolution. Hey, any questions or discussion? Mr. Hawley, can we vote? Mr. Portune? Yes. Mrs. Washburn? Yes. Mr. Jarvis? Yes. Dr. Lorenz? Yes. Ms. Pettit? Yes. Motion carried. Uh, we then move to the third resolution, which is a resolution delegating authority for de determining it impracticable or impossible to evaluate employees due to COVID-19. Do I have a motion for that resolution? Mrs. Washburn. So moved. Second. Ms. Pettit. So Mrs. Washburn moved, Ms. Pettit seconded. Um, this resolution is concerning teacher evaluation, which may not be possible uh, since it is uh, delimited in law about having a certain number of visits, a certain set of regulations, and so this allows administration to determine what is possible, what is practical, uh, what is impossible. Any questions? I see that Mrs. Wiley yep. has come back on board, so there are, if there are questions, we can ask her. Mr. Portune, did I see you wave your hand? You did. I just wanted to point out this, that this is directly out of, uh, or as a result of House Bill 197. Yes. No questions? Any discussion, Amy or Robin? Nope. Not unless you have questions. I mean, the principals understand most of the evaluations had been completed. There are very few that needed that. We, we usually do three formal. Um, a lot of them got three formal in already, and some 
um, that didn't, then they, met, they felt like they had enough data. You don't always have to do three. It depends on the person. And um, the ones that they did not get to complete, they will just mark as not completed due to COVID-19. And they'll have an opportunity then next year. They'll just go back in and start again. Okay, thank you. Anything? Okay, I don't see any discussion. Nope. Mr. Hawley, can we vote? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Washburn? Yes. Mr. Jarvis? Yes. Dr. Lorenz? Yes. Ms. Pettit? Yes. Mr. Portoon? Yes. Motion carried. Motion, uh, resolution 3.4 is a motion to approve rescheduling of board meetings. And I'll go ahead and make that uh, motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Portoon seconded. Um, so you can see that this is to approve moving meetings, uh, moving the April 21st meeting to April 30th, moving the May 5th meeting to May 12th, and moving the May 19th meeting to May 28th. It also states in this resolution that it is at this time our assumption that those meetings will be conducted in a virtual format. Uh, we are not obviously sure that there would be a closure through that period of May, but the assumption is that we will plan for those that way um, so that uh, you all know about the meetings and that the public knows about the meetings. Um, questions or discussion on those meetings? Okay, I, nope. I don't wanna jinx it, but so far it seems like this has worked um, fairly well as a meeting format. So hopefully we're, um, we're learning well and doing well in this format. So, Mr. Hawley, can we vote on that? Mm -hmm. Mr. Jarvis? Yes. Dr. Lorenz? Yes. Ms. Pettit? Yes. Mr. Portoon? Yes. Mrs. Washburn? Yes. Great. Motion carried. Um, so my assumption is that the uh, website will be changed to indicate the change in meeting dates um, and to include, as it did for this meeting, when those meetings come up to include the link where the public can access those meetings as they are streamed. All right, the next thing on the agenda is um, a discussion by the treasurer, Mr. Hawley, about costs related to building closure. And this is costs and um, not costs, just a, a general financial sense of what is happening because of the closure of school. Mr. Hawley. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Lorenz. Um, so uh, what, what I can tell you right now, uh, when we're looking at the buildings and we are looking at uh, what is occurring right now, I am, you know, I, I know the word unprecedented is probably getting used a little bit too much in people's lives at this point. Um, but I, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty safe to say that what we're looking at in the buildings are, is unprecedented. Uh, the way that we're doing uh, teaching, the way that we are uh, just, I mean, just basically everything. I mean, even with, with my staff in particular, just trying to make sure that they can work remotely. Um, a lot of it obviously has to do with uh, the protection of our people and our community. Um, and so when, when we're talking about the physical buildings being closed, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are closed as a school district. And so we've had a lot of conversation uh, this evening with, with many updates that makes it very clear that we are, we are still running. Uh, we are still running a business. Uh, we are still uh, working with our students. We're still working on campus. Uh, we're still trying to uh, take care of business as best as we possibly can uh, during this time. Um, and so when we're looking at costs, uh, again, since this is a little bit of unprecedented time, uh, we are regular, regularly reviewing and documenting needs in the district. So we're looking at uh, what's needed and required in the district. Uh, we've had many conversations over the last few weeks. We had some prep time even before this happened in anticipation of this potentially happening. Uh, just talking with each department um, and trying to understand what is required, what is needed, what's necessary and even potentially what are some of the costs above and beyond what we do right now. Uh, so, you know, when we're looking at the buildings, the reality is, is there will be some savings that we will see. Um, you know, a simple one that you can look at is utilities. So you know, the buildings 
uh, although they we do not have students in them it's more like summertime if you will where there's just not quite as many people in them so there will be some sort of savings uh, to quantify that is a little difficult at this time because again we don't have anything to look at specifically that looks like what, what's happening right now we could look at some of the summer months we could look at maybe december time frame when schools close for basically two to three weeks uh, but again you know, we're just gonna do our best estimates as we can. Um, on the flip side, there are some costs or um, receipts or revenue that we don't, we will not see. Um, so uh, one simple one to look at is food service. So uh, one of the things that runs our food service department or one of the things that we, we depend on and rely on on a regular basis is point of sale. Um, and we do, we do not have that at this point in time um, even despite some of the conversations and, and talk to this evening as to the fact that we are still feeding children within our district. It's not to the same level uh, as we were previously, but again, you know, if you think of what our relative free and reduced number is, it's, it's, pretty, pretty, it's pretty small comparatively. So when you're looking at that department in general, they, they run on revenue from those. So those are just a couple quick ways just to look at the district and some of the things that are happening a little bit differently right now. Um, so again, we are, we are actively looking at everything, making sure that we are running uh, as efficiently as we possibly can, but also understanding that we are still running a, a school business, a school district. Uh, we've talked multiple times throughout this process of how much of the money uh, or how much of the expenses through the district actually goes towards classroom instruction. We are still instructing kids. Uh, it looks different right now, but we're still doing that. Um, and so there's potentially even costs that will come up uh, that we are somewhat, uh, we're following, but we're not really aware of yet. Um, so we're just, again, I'm talking to my colleagues. I know Dr. Cross is doing the same thing uh, all the time. Uh, we're, we're, leaning on and relying on people that we, uh, that have expertise, um, have a lot of wisdom in these areas, and we're just looking at our budgets on a regular basis. Um, one of the things that we wanted to discuss specifically tonight is one of those areas where uh, there is a potential revenue impact to the district. Uh, I can let Dr. Krauss talk about more of the details when we're talking about program, um, but what you'll see on the agenda currently is, um, uh, is, is tuition for kindergarten. So we have a full day program and we have a half day program. Um, our half day program is, uh, well, ha Dr. Cross, why don't you to talk about a little bit more specifically as to the program. So um, currently in the state of Ohio, uh, school districts are required to offer a half day kindergarten. Uh, so in order to offer full day kindergarten to provide those extra opportunities for kids, different districts handle that in multiple ways. We have, um, uh, I think, seven sections this year, uh, and we lottery get into that. Uh, students who participate in the full day program do pay monthly tuition uh, for that full day program. So um, what they're not getting while being at home, they're still getting instruction from their kindergarten teacher, but part of being here all day is, is lunch and the additional special time and uh, some of the extra enrichment opportunities and different things that go on. Um, there isn't really any way to provide that extra, that additional um, in a remote way. So we really feel like um, you know, we're not providing a full day program. We're providing the kindergarten curriculum and that support, um, but we're not able to justify um, that full day um, experience in, by any chance, by any stretch. So um, that's why we, we talked about uh, refunding and not charging the, the tuition for kindergarten. Um, Preschool is a little different, and, and that's why we want to have that discussion with the board to talk through that. We do also charge uh, tuition for our typical, our typically developing preschoolers. So our preschools are blended. Um, half of the students um, in each preschool uh, have an identified disability, they have an IEP, 
Um, they get related services. They get services from the, the teacher as the special ed teacher. But then as part of our program, the state uh, provides for an integrated preschool program. So we have students who are not identified with any um, additional needs. They, we call them typically developing. And they fill up that full program that, that it's four days a week, half time. And we do charge tuition for that. Our preschool teachers are still continuing to offer online remote support for kids and experiences. Um, so that, you know, the teachers are still doing that. It's not a full day program. Um, you know, when, when I talk with my colleagues about what other people are doing, uh, there's the opportunity that you could withdraw your student if you didn't want to pay the tuition. Um, you know, you're not, most of what happens in preschool is about socialization and working together. Clearly that's not work, you know, that's not what's being provided. Um, you know, some academics are being provided, but the full experience isn't what's being provided. So there's a kind of a mixed bag out there with um, what we can do with preschool uh, tuition. You know, one opportunity is, you know, we're still providing resources to students, so we continue to charge for that. Another, another uh, way people are going is um, that if you didn't want to participate, then you could withdraw your child. And then a third way is to just, you know, look at just refunding that um, tuition or not collecting the April tuition um, just because, uh, you know, it's, it, it feels maybe like the right thing to do to um, sort of acclimate between the two, the difference of those things. So we really wanted to, to get some board insight or thoughts on, on, that, on that decision given, given that background. Kevin, does that sort of sum up? Hopefully yeah, and the one thing just to, yeah, absolutely, that's great. And the one thing just to keep in mind as well is what we're talking about in the current landscape is basically half of March's tuition and all of April's tuition uh, since Governor DeWine has basically closed schools through uh, the end of April. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure based on whatever decision is made today, we would do the same for May if that actually does occur. Uh, but we're not, we're just not there yet. Uh, we don't have any. Uh, any direction currently. So within that landscape, I don't know if any thoughts, questions. Any discussion, questions? So <clears throat> Amy, what are there any ramifications or negatives for the parents or the student if they were to withdraw from the preschool program? No, um, other than paperwork to re-enroll, you know, their, their child in that way. Um, I guess a technical question, Kevin, on the, the half of, of March um, is <clears throat> just because um, I don't know how the payment normally is for March, but because that's when spring break week is in there, does that, does that play any part in the amount? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a challenge because we start later in August, but we receive payments in August as well. So we just thought, um, you know, if you're looking at total days in March, um, you could actually argue that the refund would be less than 50%. Um, I think we just felt that that was probably uh, the right, the right way to go uh, with that in particular. I have a question. Is there, um, a, as I see that there's the kindergarten refund on the agenda, that's a recommendation from the administration to do that. Is there a recommendation concerning preschool? Um, is there a sense that the preschool program is getting um, sufficient um, uh, value from the preschool teachers and that there is an opportunity for the students to um, withdraw if they want to. So is the recommendation from the administration that we simply provide refunds for those who withdraw? Or um, um, in other words, the, the kindergarten recommendation is clearly that they are not getting the extra half day. If there is a refund for preschool, will we still be providing the preschool program um, 
or if you get a refund, do you have to withdraw? That's the, I'm trying to ask the question that way. So if, if we were to refund preschool, uh, our preschool teachers would still continue to provide the resources that they're, that they're providing to our three and four year olds. Uh, they're providing those for um, the students who are on an IEP that continues those, the students are, uh, don't pay tuition. Uh, so that would continue on. We certainly wouldn't um, take a three-year-old who wanted to log in to hear Miss Lynn read the story in the morning to keep that child from doing that. Um, my recommendation would be to continue to allow our kids to access that. Um, you know, my, my, my feeling about that is, is I, I get the idea of withdrawing. Um, I just, when I think about all of the things that are going on, I I would like not to add another stress onto our families of withdrawing and re-enrolling into a program. Um, I, I'd, I'd rather make the decision about that from a, you know, a financial discussion or whether it's a service discussion with the board. Um, but I just, I hate to add an additional layer of paperwork onto people um, in a time when, you know, we're, we're all struggling with, you know, far different things. Okay. Where, where are neighboring districts falling out on the preschool issue? They're split right down the middle, about 50-50. Um, uh, and always withdrawing is a, um, even if their choice is to continue to charge, withdrawing is always part of that. I mean, that's, I mean, that's that would be your prerogative at any time. Right, right. What amount of money are we looking at in refunds if we refund the preschool families? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, as of uh, the data that I had right before spring break, so we may have received some more payments in April, um, just because we still weren't sure what we were doing at this point. But I can tell you, so that's there's actually two separate questions involved there. Uh, if we're looking at half of March and all of April, you are looking at a refund of roughly eight thousand dollars if you look at it from the standpoint of total loss of revenue it's roughly about nineteen thousand almost twenty thousand um, dollars you know with that in because mind you'd be expecting more to come in yes yeah so like right now april only had a tenth of what we would have expected at this point uh, what that probably was is some people do prepay at the beginning of the year and and then uh, we give everybody a booklet, kind of like you would with your mortgage or something like that. And so people are sending in payments uh, every month. So you're looking at roughly 20 grand in lost revenue. If you go through the end of the year, you're looking at just under roughly $33,000 in lost revenue. Um, total refund though would be just over 21,000 because we, we, uh, we take a deposit at the beginning of the year to hold your spot and we apply that to May as their May tuition. So basically we have already received May's tuition. Any other questions? I guess my suggestion would be at this point, we have the agenda item for the kindergarten refund what we would need at this point is either a board member request to add an agenda item, to amend the agenda, or uh, if we do not have that, um, then uh, unless the administration asks us for a resolution to refund, we would be leaving preschool the way it is. Am I reading that correctly? That's correct. Sounds correct. We're all thinking. Right. Yeah. I understand that. I'm watching you think. I mean, personally, I feel like if we're refunding kindergarten and with looking out for our community, I feel like it should be refunded. But I'm also very open to hearing the other side of the argument. I feel like I feel personally like from a preschool perspective I agree with Amy that the 
a big piece of that is the socialization and the it's the in-person provision of the service mm -hmm. and not not to take anything away from the great job that our preschool teachers are doing remotely but it becomes simply a video source of a preschooler to watch something yeah um, just not the same it's not the same and and it might be that the parent is still required to be there to keep attention or that the parent is you know working i just think there's a lot there and my from my perspective for preschool it does not make sense to collect that money and it makes sense to refund that money for certainly for april and i also agree with what amy said if we go that route um or any route making parents withdraw just seems like an extra layer of burden to put on people it does and what i don't want to get into i think um I've heard of another district too, where it's, well, if you request it, you can get mm -hmm. refunded. I don't want to get into that kind of a situation because that's, that's a poor, to me, a very poor way to implement anything is, Hey, if you knew about it, you could do it. You could get the money back. But if you don't, that's, I mean, that's not what we're about either. I, I agree with Ned and Eileen. I only suggested the notion of withdrawing as having heard that, somewhere in the yeah. discussion. In other words, I wasn't right. suggesting that that be a motion. It was just a, a possible. And when Ned was speaking, it occurred to me that uh, originally I was thinking, well, if they're still getting the preschool teachers work, um, they're still getting preschool. But if ever there's a student at home that needs a parent to help them connect and help them do whatever they're doing with preschool, certainly there's a, there's a homeschooling aspect to getting a preschool child to get what they can out of remote learning. So um, they're, they're not getting the in-school preschool, certainly. So I do wanna clarify a little bit on, you know, when, when Mr. Holly talks about the loss of revenue total um, by refunding, I, I would say that, you know, if we choose not to refund, we will then communicate with the preschool families that we're going to continue to charge unless they withdraw. So, you know, right. my guess would be that then they would withdraw. And so that, that revenue is, um, that, that revenue stream will not be there anyway. Be lost will anyway. Withdraw. Right, yeah. people mm -hmm. will withdraw. And, and so I guess that's my, I, I just that clarification. It's not about, you know, losing the money. Certainly we understand we need to watch the budget, but families will withdraw because they need to do that so that they can have that revenue stream back in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, and I just... Um, if there's any way we have the opportunity to remove some red tape for people so that they don't have to do that at this particular time would be my recommendation. I can get on board with that. I've heard from myself and two others, so I've heard from three. Certainly I'll give Mr. Jarvis and Ms. Pettit a chance to uh, weigh in. I would simply suggest at this point, since we have not yet made the motion to refund tuition for full day kindergarten, a simple way to amend the agenda would be for a board member to make that resolution and have it include preschool tuition refund as well. So say full day kindergarten and preschool without having to go through another motion to amend the agenda and a motion to uh, add another agenda item, we could simply have that resolution contain both if that's the wish of the board. I would, I would definitely, I would like to make that motion. Okay, I have, you have to tell me all the things to say though. Uh, I believe that I have Mrs. Washburn making a resolution to <coughs> recommend to refund tuition for full day kindergarten and preschool for 50% of March and 100% of April. Correct. Is there, is there a second for that? I will second that. And I have Mr. Portune seconding. Now, I promised Mr. Jarvis and Ms. Pettit a chance to say something. I'm waiting to see if they want to weigh in on this. I have a question. I am the one that pays the kindergarten tuition, so do I need to recuse from this one? Hmm. Would probably be good to. Okay. Good question. That is a good question. 
Mr. Jarvis, yeah. do you pay kindergarten tuition? <laughs> <laughs> only, only for a 15-week-old puppy. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, you know, here, the thing I'm kind of just sitting over here chewing on is, is you know, we we made decisions based on uh, having this, and we are stuck with those decisions whether we like them or not, right? But uh, I think the way I am leaning toward uh, after listening to some of the discussion is that uh, why should we be a uh, further pain in the backside of people? So um, I, I would lean toward supporting such a resolution. So, I mean, if, if we were if we were looking at Riding off the entire year. I don't know if that would make a difference to me or not, but uh, based on the numbers I'm hearing and things like that, uh, my my opinion is it's not worth the added strife to people. So I'm I'm good with the motion. Any other questions or discussion? I, I do understand what Mr. Jarvis was saying that we had made decisions, hiring decision, hiring decisions with the personnel to cover full day kindergarten, the personnel to cover preschool. Um, and so this is um, a, a cost to the district, but it feels like it is the correct thing to do for families that have been affected by these unprecedented times, by this, this situation that is not of anyone's making uh, in this group at this meeting or any of the preschool or kindergarten families. So, agreed. Any other, agreed. Yeah. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, Mr. Hawley, can we vote on that resolution? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Washburn? Yes. Ms. Pettit? Abstain? Abstain. Mr. Fortune? Yes. Dr. Lorenz? Yes. Mr. Jarvis? Yes. Okay. Motion carried. Um, I believe we're at the end of what is on the agenda in board docs. Is there any other question, any other uh, mention of anything the board would like to make? We do not meet again until April 30th. No, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Knapp for his work on getting this all set up and live streaming. Hey, Kathy, one quick question on that vote. Yes. Did we need to vote to change the agenda to add pre-K and then re-vote? I don't believe so because we had not made the resolution. Um, and so the resolution was made including both. Okay. Um, and certainly there's discussion in the meeting about um, uh, making that change in the, um, in the resolution. And I believe that even if we had made the resolution, uh, you can make a friendly amendment to a resolution as long as the, the person who moves it uh, agrees to it as well. So that's why I suggested that we could do it that way. I believe that's according to um, regulations. That's great. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Mr. Portoon for all the work that he did, all the research he did in mm -hmm. uh, helping us figure out the best way to uh, enter into this uh, remote uh, meeting venture, adventure. Um, and I feel like we did pretty well. We're coming in under two hours. And I kind of like this Brady Bunch thing, looking at you all in the little pictures here. So um, we will- Agreed, but it's much better in person. Yeah, it is much better in person. 100%. But, but certainly we will be doing this on April 30th. So. Um, Anything else to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? I see Mrs. Pettit well, waving. I can't hear her. She's muted, but she's <laughs> waving. And I do, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Mr. Jarvis waved second. So I'll second. Mrs. Pettit moved and Mr. Jarvis seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned at 8 p.m. All right. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.